Um, what I'll do is I'll start uh, by playing a quick video. Uh, this video inspired me to set up the company Social Retail almost six years ago now. Uh, so I thought I'd share the video with you. If you've seen it before, then I apologise. If you haven't seen it, then definitely listen carefully. Uh, I will try and condense these slides into the shortest possible time period because I do want to give you the opportunity to put me on the spot and ask me questions around social media and growing business. So I'll uh, play this quick video. Has anyone seen that video before? No. No? Oh, fantastic. I want to be like the old days. Um, so I was very lucky at an early age to have a career at Waitrose, um, one of the best retailers in the world, I hope. <laughs> and at 16, we were taught to be personal. If a customer asked us, where's the bread? We didn't just say over there, go and find itself. We actually had to take them there. So very early age, I was, it was in, indoctrinated into me to be personal, <coughs> to serve the customer, to listen to the customer. Um, and then I had a very good career within Waitrose, went up to Waitrose head office, ran their first marketing department, took them online in 98, 99, we launched Waitrose.com and then I ended up, um, rather by accident, setting up online departments for other retailers, Toys R Us and Hamleys, uh, raised venture capital, ran a business and then set up social retail. Um, I set up social retail because I don't like the term social media, it implies it's a media channel that you have to advertise on. I call it social technology, it's a people sport, and I'm going to share with you some of the, uh, the information I use on some of the training courses I run for retailers, and I work at the um, Henley Business School as well, and do workshops for MBA students on how this thing is evolving, the marketing mix and the customer service channel. It's very easy to be personal when you're starting a business with a pound and a smartphone, like I did, because every customer is important, that sounds obvious thing to say. But it's really hard, very hard, in fact, some would say impossible, when you grow as a business and you get the size of Waitrose's now to still be personal. So the challenge for, for, your, for your businesses is how do I remain personal? Um, what's the benefit of being personal? Um, and how will that help me? So I'll share with you some thoughts. Um, you can switch your mobile phones on and you can tweet live if you're on Twitter. Um, there's a few companies I work with um, so really I've just got three steps, if you remember nothing else, just this slide please. Um, in this order, listening, and then planning your reply, and then most importantly then engaging in a conversation. This isn't advertising, I don't use social media to advertise, I don't believe in Facebook advertising, I don't believe in Twitter advertising, I've used those mediums, and in my other business I run a charity which is business consumer, and we just didn't get a return. So I take a human approach, which is listening to my customers, finding out what they like, what they don't like, and shaping my proposition uh, to give me uh, satisfaction that they're going to be satisfied with the offer. But most importantly, that it's the highest margin as well. So I'm not one of these social media people that says you must advertise on Facebook, you must be on Facebook, because not every business will benefit from that way because not every business is engineered to be that agile. So hopefully I can share with you some ideas of how some businesses do do this. So I don't know who this guy is but I saw this and I thought it was a great quote and it kind of summed up what I was trying to do uh, and help my clients listen closely and replying well. So an intelligent reply assumes that you know a bit about that person to start with. So I'm not talking about a numbers game of mailing a certain number of people, planning a response and being happy with that. I'm talking about every single connection with a customer is personal. And as humans, we are leaving footprints in the snow. So there is a mountain of data, a growing mountain of data. We call it big data. Uh, I'm a particular um, specialist in local data, geotag data. And I'll share with you some, some reports I, I've produced with people. Um, so the answers are out there. People are saying things on Twitter, they're saying things on Facebook, they're pinning stuff on Pinterest, they're using Instagram or Vine, they're Snapchatting, they're using WhatsApp, and they are giving you these clues as to what they're interested in. Uh, and if you're a mail order business, 
targeting 13 to 18 year olds or 16, 18 to 25 year old young audience, then you would know this and you would, you would change your mail order approach. So what I'm talking about is re-engineering some businesses. Unfortunately, I, I don't think some businesses will survive because they're not engineered this way. Um, some retailers won't survive and we've seen, in the case of some very large retailers, they haven't survived. So I believe, if you're personal, you can grow your margin and survive. This is a chart I use to explain the depth of local listening that you can do. So this is, I just picked on an area called Reading, where I live, and quite passionate about Reading. And you can buy data. These are all geotagged tweets. So these are people who have tweeted with their location switched on. Um, and that data is available to buy, actually. Or if you, if you know how, you can go onto Twitter and search for it in real time. Uh, and you can get all sorts of information. You can find out what mobile device they're using, uh, what operating system they're on. You can get their name. Sometimes it's their real name, sometimes it's a made-up name. So you, you have to intelligently sift through this data and work out where is my customer. So just to make it clear, I'm only talking about business use of social media. I'm not interested in the people talking about making personal connections. Um, I did a report last year. Um, I recorded geotag tweets from four towns, Reading, Bristol, Manchester and Newcastle over Easter, which was a bit earlier last year, and I was amazed. There were 72,000 tweets across those towns, and I was amazed at the social layer that exists now in towns and cities around the world, not just the UK. Uh, <coughs> and I produced a report called the High Street Report. I've just this weekend finished uh, recording the data, and you're the first people to hear that it's gone from 72,000 to just over 100,000 tweets about 30% growth, and in those four towns, the same polygon, if you're a geographical person, uh, Reading was up 64%, Bristol was up 64%, uh, Manchester and Newcastle weren't up as much. So either those towns have peaked and they've got their social traffic, or there's still growth to go. So if you have stores, or a store, and geography is important to you, this is really important information. That gives you an idea of the sort of spread of tweets across those towns. And time of day was quite interesting. Newcastle stayed up an hour later to tweet than Reading. Don't know why. They're more sociable than the guys in Reading. Um, and the conversation topics were different. There was a commonality. Football was very common, actually. The football, for those of you who know hashtags, the football hashtag for the local football team was used in those towns quite importantly. Um, and there was a stag party on in Newcastle as well. Um, so there's a lot of tweeting going on there. So if you're a nighttime economy, if you run a restaurant, uh, you see what's going on with your eyes, but actually there's this invisible social layer that's growing and it's emerging. It's very <coughs> small, it is very small, but what I wanted to prove is that even if you take a very small polygon around a particular two mile radius in a town, you can get some rich data. But if you magnify that up and look globally, and I've decided to compare New York with Paris and London, um, interestingly, this was a while ago now, um, in New York, very little desktop tweeting. In fact, 0%. Over this 24, I did one day in New York, one day in Paris, and one day in London. And I compared how people were being mobile and how they were talking and using social media. Um, and Paris had the highest percentage of using desk. So I took the assumption here that New York is more mobile than London. London is more mobile than Paris. Now, if you're a department store operating in those three cities, this is really important information, how you're going to build your customer footfall, how you're going to launch a new store in an area. When you refurbish the store, how are you going to connect with those people? And I will say connect on social first because it's the cheapest way of doing things. Um, but you have to think carefully and build your strategy so it's built to last. And this is actual picture from Reading. Sorry, I do go on about Reading quite a lot, sorry. Um, it's a good place. And this, was how, this is what happens if you don't have a good structure in place, a good strategy. Now, I'm not trying to sell you a strategy. Um, I'm trying to use this session to help you help yourself. So what, what uh, Abacus is going to do is they're going to email you through the sheets, one of the sheets I use. This is a self-assessment sheet. 
Uh, it's double sided, there's 20 questions. It's designed for you to give yourself a score out of 100 on how well you're using social media in your business today. So that's going to be emailed to you. And I would definitely recommend you have a go. Um, you can give me feedback if you like. I'm not interested in the score, but it's really for you to do a sort of a self evaluation of your business. Uh, and this is the title of my book, um, which isn't finished yet. Um, and I nicked this expression from my dad, my late father, who said, measure twice, cut once, because he was a carpenter. So I sort of used that and thought, think twice, tweet once. Mainly because when I started learning about Twitter, uh, setting up my charity in Reading, I was tweeting every Friday for three and a half years, um, live commentary on local bands, original bands, because I set up a music charity for teenagers in Reading. And I thought I had a pound and a smartphone. I didn't have any advertising budget, but I wanted to go to the gigs. So I would do the homework and find the gigs, and I would tweet live. And for six months, no one watched any of my tweets. Uh, and I used the same hashtag on each tweet. Eventually, someone retweeted, and then it started to snowball. And then the local press got involved, the local radio got involved. Um, and then we got attention. So I was trying to seek attention. But I was adding value. I wasn't tweeting an advert. I tried that and it didn't work. And people said, get off, stop selling. So I knew that social media used intelligently had to be a conversation tool. It, it wasn't an advertising tool. So if you do have social media agencies ringing you up, selling ad space on Facebook, you can tell them to go away <laughs> if you want to. We can try it and spend some money. It's entirely to you, it's your money. So that's really step one of being personal, is listening. You decide where you want to listen. Do you want to listen in a local area? Do I want to listen at brand level? Um, there are listening devices out there. There are companies who are very good selling very good intelligent systems. So I definitely recommend you get your ears open. And then moving on to how do you plan? So in the handout, it talked about me 10 things I was going to do today. So I consolidated that into three points. So I call it a risk assessment because every connection you make online, I'm dealing with companies that are 200 to 500 million retailers with physical locations. That's my market. They have got a reputation that they don't want to lose. So I train their shop floor people to tweet from their shop floor. That's my <coughs> solution, effectively, for social media. So I train them on how to risk assess. And what, well that, what I mean by that is, um, look at what could go wrong if I connect with this person. This person should give me all the information because I know what they're saying, I know what they're tweeting, or if it's a Facebook connection, I know their profile. Um, what's their motivation if I do connect with them? Uh, how can I predict the behavior? Are they gonna retweet? Are they interested in my range of clothing, my fashion range, my furniture? Uh, how am I gonna empower these people to be my ambassadors? Um, and if you can get this right, your customers become your ambassadors and they start sharing your, your news which is awesome, actually. The ROI is fantastic there. But you have to keep an eye on it. Um, I always say be the world's best at one thing, one topic. It's very tempting when you're setting up a business and you've got a range of however many SKUs you have in your range. Uh, and it's very tempting to build the range and grow. But actually, niche is very good. I love niche. Because as soon as someone finds your niche, they're a friend and hopefully a customer for life. So I actually like conversations that are very single-minded and focused because people think, oh, I'm going to go to those because they know all about handmade furniture, they know all about fashion, they know all about giftware or accessories. Um, and don't be distracted, this is my advice from making mistakes by the way, by irrelevant topics of conversation. Last year I was invited by Mary Porters to do some training in Bedford. Uh, 22 businesses were part of the regeneration of Bedford. And for those of you who don't know, Mary Portis is trying to reinvent the high street. Um, and I was asked to come in and train these businesses. And it felt a bit like um, Harvey Jones or, the, or Digby Jones, as we now say. It felt a bit like that. And some of the businesses I felt like saying, really, don't, don't try. Um, some of them were tweeting all sorts of stuff. Nothing to do with getting their hair cut in, in Bedford. They were talking about politics. They were talking about tax and all sorts of stuff, and terrorism. I said, just focus on why people should come to you and get their hair cut. What's special about you? 
And eventually, if you do find a community, we call them hashtags. Uh, I'm dealing with retailers who are very focused on conversation topics in their local areas where they have stores. Uh, so we talk about communities that hang out on hashtags, uh, not emotional hashtags, hashtag fail, things like that, stay away, away from that. So you can actually build a community, I've done it, uh, there's more, more than me, have done it. others have done build a community. But any community is always giving and receiving, so you have to give before you receive. You have to offer something of value. So it could be content around your products, it could be an image, it could be the story behind that, why that product was handmade, what's so special about it. What it shouldn't be is an offer or an incentive to follow. Because I think, um, still early days, but my view is that if you incentivize people to like you, please like me, retweet and enter a competition, it just doesn't work. Yes, you will get a following, but it's a short honeymoon period because they won't come back because you've not really engaged in a conversation with them. So I definitely don't recommend incentivizing follows or likes. And then you've got to plan your content. How am I going to talk to these people? Is it an image? Is it video? Is it text? Is it audio? Podcasting is absolutely awesome. Uh, ideally, it's customer-generated stories um, because it's the most cost-effective way of them being your ambassadors and doing your marketing for you. So if we focus on customer service rather than marketing and advertising, let's, let's every customer that comes into contact with our company through mail order, through the telephone, through email, or through a tweet, Let's make that service as possible, as personal as possible. And they will actually tell at least on average 150 people. That's the sort of expression. Um, who is the best person? So we talked about listening, talked about planning. How do we engage? Who in my company should I give this job to? Um, I don't understand it. I'll give this to someone they're young, they understand it. Actually, you should give it to someone who knows about the product. It could be you, because if you're making the buying choice for your business and you're going out to these trade fairs and you're selecting your products, you've made that decision to buy that product and you know why your customers want to buy it. And the only difference then is the bit of time that it takes to, to tell your customer, good news, you've now hunted and gathered this product and here it is ready for you to buy. So it could be you. Um, If you decide it's not going to be you, and it's going to be a team, then I would definitely recommend that you invest time finding someone local who knows about social media, who can train you. <coughs> so I think that's really important. Keep the knowledge and skills within your business, and try and empower as many people as possible, not just the customer engaging bit, but the bit that goes through crowdsourcing this whole solution as well. Um, and then you'll be a very agile business. You must trust them. You must trust these people, and therefore you must invest in them. Uh, and where possible, try not to make it too, too much of a script, because we're all consumers as well, so we, we don't like a script. We like a human personal experience, so why don't we give that to our customers as well? Um, and ultimately, over time, what you should be able to do is build up your own, what I call social retail intelligence, uh, your own library of conversations. So that's what it is. It's a new way of looking at a business. It's different to the, the traditional ways. Uh, and I'm a big fan of Acorn and Mosaic and those. I use them a lot in radio rentals and Rumblows, my very first job. Um, but this is additional. This is attitudinal. This is uh, emotional data. This is social data. Um, and keep it refreshed. So you need to start engineering your business, I guess, into how we're going to store this data um, and how we're going to keep it real time trending. How are we going to keep the board? up to date with what's going on. So in 2011, I did a talk in the Horticultural Trade Association. A guy called Andy McKindo came up to me and said, Pete, this is all very good, but my guys are over 60. My customers are over 60. Uh, we're a, a traditional garden centre. We've been around for 149 years then, or 150 years now. Uh, I don't think this is right, but there's something in this I want to try. So we, we did a pilot in three garden centres, uh, Bath, uh, and Eastbourne, and ooh, what's going on? There we are. And we, I trained up the three people, two people in each store, garden centre, to tweet um, in the plant area, because Hillier, if you don't know Hillier Garden Centres, they have got an expertise in plants and horticulture. They've won 68 
gold medals at Chelsea. They know about plants. Uh, they've got a royal warrant, um, so they know about trees and plants and shrubs. And they have a fantastic encyclopedia of plant knowledge and publications. Um, so I knew this was good territory. There was something good at the core of this business. All we had to do was train these people to engage in a personal conversation about their garden and how Hillier and their people on the shop floor could help them source the right plants for their garden. And as we all know, if you've got a garden, it's quite a personal thing having a garden. So we, we piloted it. We didn't really know where it was going to go. Um, we had our first sale within eight weeks, eight days, sorry. Um, and that was a tweet. That was just a random person who followed the store. And part of the training I do is to be polite and etiquette. Uh, and so they replied and said, thank you for following. Can I help? And it's that can I help and that open question that really got the person following them to think. And they said, well, actually, you might be able to. I'm thinking of doing my garden. Um, and I'm not quite sure what to buy. They said, come into the store and we'll carry on the conversation. And that's it. So that's all you need to do. They came in the store, they bought 80 rolls of turf, and we had a sale. But most importantly, that turf could be at a premium price. It doesn't have to be an offer. And this is how you can grow your margins. I genuinely believe you can, if you listen to your customers, you can get them to shop your shop or shop your catalogue and present the catalogue to them in a personal way. And what we did was we then looked at uh, the reach of people started following them. It wasn't so much the amount of followers, it was the quality of followers. So I talk about quality over quantity. Um, it was such a success, we rolled it out across 13 garden centres and we managed to take a situation where they used Twitter at head office. They had been using Twitter for three years, by the way, um, prior to us helping them. And it was just corporate tweeting and Mark Pittman, who's now moved on to work at Waitrose, who was the operations director, said corporate tweeting for us didn't work. It felt like we were talking to no one, talking to a vacuum. But as soon as we localised it, it was a real person on the shop floor giving live commentary of what was going on on the shop floor, new products arriving, all the excitement and buzz. It created something new and exciting for them. And we chose this as our strategy before going to e-commerce, actually. So they approached me and said, shall we go into e-commerce or shall we do local social media? And I said, well, let's try local social media first. <coughs> And there's a video up on, on our website, you're more than welcome to, I won't bore you with it now, but um, I videoed Mark, who was the operations, the shop floor assistant, but most importantly, Georgina, who was the customer. She didn't used to shop in Hillier, but she was big on Twitter. Twitter popped up on, it, Hillier popped up on her timeline, and um, it wasn't an advert, it was a conversation, so she connected with that, and it's now become her garden centre of choice. And I'm running out of time, so sorry. But I'll put a few tweets on there. For me, this tweet on the right here is, is an example of what I'm looking for, which is a customer's bought a product, they've had the pre-sales conversation, they've taken it home, they've taken a picture in their garden, and they've tweeted it back to the, to the shop to say thank you. And the shop can then continue the conversation. I know what will look just right next to that plant. If you come in next Tuesday, I'll sort you out. So, it's a great way of retailing socially, hence the name of the company, Social Retail, sorry. I couldn't think of a better name for the company. So, so five tips to take away. <coughs> um, obviously, listen carefully, don't broadcast offers. I'll get that tattooed and sent out. It really doesn't work. Uh, don't incentivize people to like you. We don't do it when we're meeting people. Please like me. We don't do it, so why should we do it for our businesses that we care about. But definitely listen to them. Plan your responses. Assess the risks of connecting with people. Narrow conversation topics. Empower as many people in your business to tweet, um, and preferably succession plan as well. And most importantly, like we saw in that video at the start, don't have an ego, because that brand ego just doesn't work anymore with us. We don't connect. But let's listen and not shout. Um, so I hope that gives you a few ideas. Um, I don't want to eat into my colleague, uh, the next speaker's time, but I'm around all day if you want to talk. Am I allowed to take a question? Yeah. So if anyone's got a question. Sorry. Yeah. When it goes horribly wrong, like the NYPD recently, what's your recommendation? Um, depends how you define horribly wrong. One of my clients, had two very bad cases 
One was a staff, these are big companies, one was a staff member who posted a, a YouTube video um, criticising the management of that company and they used a Nazi uniform video. So it was pretty bad. But it was done in a way that was actually not threatening to a human life, so it wasn't that risky in terms of human life, but it was damaging to the, effectively their internal management was being played out online. Um, so we did a risk assessment. And in fact, that ended up quite well. That person had actually struck a chord with so many of other people who worked in the business that they then started to change the way they reward and incentivize their staff. So he had actually achieved quite a lot from doing that. And he did take the video down. Normally you'd have a remedy, in that case you'd have a social media policy for your staff and the remedy could be anything from disciplinary to gross misconduct. Um, the other one was when it went um, wrong externally and it was a customer, it was a situation which is still very sensitive and they had to go quiet on social media because it was so bad, there were so many accusations going around this particular incident that was happening. It's difficult to talk about it without giving away the company, but um, it was a major PR disaster. Their brand was in ruins. A lot of swearing, a lot of vitriolic abuse, a lot of capital letters on Facebook. And at that point, if they were public listed, you would see a drop in their share price. So they, their strategy there was to go quiet for a week and not to try and do anything to counteract it, just to be humble. Um, and then gradually, when they came back a week later, they took away some of the comments that were in breach of their house rules. Because you can have house rules on a Facebook page, for example, that says to people, if you're going to post stuff on our Facebook page, please stick within these rules. Um, but that's probably the most severe thing. Um, but the secret is to do the prevention. Uh, and that is to plan, I should say, plan your risk assessment. Who am I going to connect with? Um, if your business is really wholesome and you've got a really lovely story to tell, you should fly. This is a great opportunity. It's a very cost-effective tool. You don't have to spend money to be on social media, but your time is very valuable, so you have to plan your time. That's really important. Uh, and your staff time if they're on social media. But if you do it right and sensibly, um, you can build a business and you can grow your business. Any other questions? Okay, well, thanks very much. Thank you.